So in the last couple of sermons that I gave, I talked about, I think two or three weeks ago, it was let your requests be made known to God. And then last week, we, uh, the theme was with God, all things are possible. And we talked about the text where the camel is to go through the eye of a needle. And we look at things like that and we say, oh, it's just not possible. And sometimes we look around the world today and we think certain things. And I'll be honest, there are things in my life that I wonder sometimes, is it possible? Is it possible? One of my requests today uh, that Brother Rick covered in his uh, prayer time is one of those things that I wonder, is it possible? Is it possible? Those of you who know me well know what I'm talking about. But I believe it is. And I think a matter of those things happening, sometimes our prayers coming to fruition may have to do with as much faith as we have, or maybe they're not happening perhaps because I lack faith. Maybe my prayer in that regard hasn't been answered because of my faith isn't where it needs to be. So I have to consider those things when we talk about stuff like this, when we talk about prayer. Does God answer prayers today? Well, I'm a testament that God does answer prayers today. And I think it's where the desire of our heart is. I, I want to say this too. I was talking to my uh, mom and dad yesterday. We had a long conversation on the phone. It was, it was very encouraging, I think, to all of us. And one of the things that I said to them, I said, you know, I can, I have been, God has given me a gift to be bold enough to witness to anyone at any time, in any place, in any situation, with confidence. I never had that confidence before. I didn't have that before I asked him for it. But he gave that to me. But there's one area where I lack the confidence, and it has to do with the request, and that's when witnessing to my wife. For some reason, I can witness to anyone, but when it comes to witnessing to my wife, I don't know what happens. It's like I, I can't think. I can't get it out. I, it doesn't come to me. And maybe it's because she's so important to me. Maybe he's telling me, you need to be quiet. Let me do my work. And so I just have to throw it in his hands. And so this is one of the areas where you can pray for me in that regard, that even though I know and I have proof and I can prove absolutely that God answers prayers today because of my life in this one place, this is the prayer that I've been praying the longest of any. And it's the one that I just I have to wait. God's timing is impeccable. And I've learned that through this ministry and through being around my brothers and sisters here and those of you who tune in on the Zoom meet. So what I'd like to do is I would like to take a look very quickly at part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Let's just, I've got it on the PowerPoint. You can turn your Bible there if you like. This is Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. And this is a text that's very near and dear to our brother Ed's heart. And it says here, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. And the next verse is so important. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it might, no, it says it will. It will be opened. So the, when Jesus says these words, he's not asking to, that, do you think this can happen? Do you think it's possible? Is, is this something that might take place? No, he says, if you ask, we have to ask with confidence. It says, seek. We have to seek as we're searching for some treasure. We have to knock. You know, I was part of a church most of my life where we knocked on doors, and I remember some people would go to the door, and they really didn't want to talk to anybody, and they'd just kind of, because they didn't want anybody coming to the door. But when I went up, I would knock on that door because I wanted to talk to somebody. So maybe we're just not knocking persistently enough or hard enough. Maybe we're not asking enough. Maybe we're not seeking in the direction that we're praying for. 
So in considering these things, you better believe that I'm doing a serious self-examination when it comes to praying for certain things. I'm lacking somewhere. I must be. I must be. So this brings me also to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. This is from the New King James. It's on the PowerPoint. Jesus says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, that's in Jesus, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, Jesus says, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask what? Anything in my name, I will do it. It doesn't say might. I will do it. So we need to ask, we need to seek, we need to knock. Do it in accordance with God's will. Do it in accordance with the will of the Son of God, and it will be done. But in order to do those things in the will of God and his son, we have to know God's character and his son's character. The only way that we can know those things is by study of the Bible. So when we're, when we're considering these things, I know that over the years there have been people praying for me. I know many years ago, just as a very small part of my personal testimony, and a lot of you have heard me talk about this. Everyone here, I believe, has. But there were uh, several people praying for me. And I was part of a particular denomination, and I had come in contact with someone, and they knew somebody that was having a prayer meeting, and somehow my name got dropped into the prayer request list. And believe it or not, our brother Rick and our sister Mary saw my name drawn up on a whiteboard in front of a prayer group. They had a whiteboard, and they would write the names of who, like Brother Rick today. He had a list. Brother Ed, when he prays on Wednesday nights, he has a list, and he writes those things down. Well, they do it on a whiteboard so that people there would remember those names and be able to pray for those people. Well, Mark Martin happened to be one of the names on that list, and nobody in that prayer meeting had ever met me. How did my name end up there? I think it was miraculous. The right person at the right time had to be in the right place to meet me, to know what I was going through, to be able to pray for me. And people that didn't even know me were praying for me. And if you know anything about my background, you'd understand what a miracle it is that I was able to get out and that I was able to come out and know the things that I know and understand now, even studying the Bible that they have that is a tainted Bible. If God has a will for you, he will find a way to get you through whatever it is you're going through. But you have to want that. You have to ask, you have to seek, you have to knock. And I was able to study my way out. The right people at the right time. There was a man named Claude. There was a man named Harry Charlie. There was a, a lady that had a huge impact on my life. Her name was Pat Miller. And there are three people here that had a huge impact on my life, and that's Rick, his wife Mary, and my brother Ed. Huge impact on my life through some years that were very critical in my life. So after meeting these brothers and sisters, Rick, Mary, and Ed, we wanted to do some evangelism. Actually, I met Ed at the point of doing the evangelism, I think. But we wanted to do some evangelism, and we decided that we would do it as lay people. Well, what happened was we began doing this lay ministry. Uh, we, 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 it actually went very well. And lots of people came to the first Bible series that we did in 2012. This wasn't directed by any church or any organization. It was just lay people, just Christian people coming together who had beliefs in common and wanted to reach people with the Word of God. And we did that. Well, as time went on, there were some issues that came up. And this little group that you see here had kind of formed. And we started to study the Bible independent of churches and denominations, just seeing what the Bible said. And we found that our churches were wrong <laughs> about some things. And of course, we went round and around. I uh, won't get into all of that. You know, we would study and we would disagree about things. And, and in time, 
we have ended up on the same page. I had major adjustments I had to make in what my thinking was, and they had major adjustments they had to make in what their thinking was. And somehow, by the grace of God and by the word of God, we came together and just accepted what this book says. And so we continue to do ministry. Well, we could no longer, with a clean conscience, keep going to the churches that we were a part of. And so we decided to start a little group, and we started meeting. And we actually rented a little Sunday school room from a Mennonite church. One of my customers was a Mennonite pastor. And I was telling him about what had happened, what we were doing. And, and he says, well, why don't you just use one of our Sunday school rooms? And it was actually the one down at, on Hopeman Parkway. Um, uh, Howard Miller was the guy's name. And he was the pastor's name. And Howard allowed us to use one of their little rooms. And some of the earliest videos that you'll see from Prophecies of Hope were recorded in that room. And we're, um, we're actually standing in the corner of the room because the room was so small. And there was just a small group of us there. Well, as time went on, we decided, you know, setting up and tearing down, and we're in this church where really there's false doctrines that are being taught. We don't agree with the doctrines of the church. It's kind of hard to invite people here because they might think we're affiliated. So we just started praying for a place, and we looked at several locations, and it was interesting some of the things that we saw. One of them didn't have a bathroom, and another one, I think, had this cornerstone that had Trinity right on the cornerstone, and I, I looked at it, I said, that's the first thing that's going, as soon as I saw that. And, and, you know, it's just all of these things were happening, and it just seems like it just fell through, fell through, fell through. It just wasn't the time. So we kept praying. And then finally, one Sunday afternoon, I'm driving down West Beverly Street, the street right here, and I look to my right, and I see this building on the PowerPoint. Well, guess what? This building is this church. It was called Bread of Life. I don't know if you see it there on the front. Here's a, here's a front shot straight on. This was what the building looked like the first day. I've driven, driven past it hundreds of times, and this was the first time I'd ever noticed it. And you can see, especially from this angle, there is a for sale sign right next to that telephone pole. And this was the angle that I approached the church. And then I took this picture also from the side. I took these pictures, and I sent them to... Uh, Ed and Rick and Mary, and I said, hey, look at this building. This is right in town. This is right here. And I went around back and took these pictures from up on the hill. You can see what that looks like from First Street. That's the street up behind us. And then I zoomed in on it a little bit. So you can see the church and the apartment next to it. And then a little close-up of the church. It needs a paint job, among other things. We'll get into here in a moment. And then here is a shot from... Uh, just actually facing kind of uh, eastward, kind of facing uh, northeast. And that's my old pickup truck sitting there. I should have moved it, but I didn't know what the property line was. I didn't know if I could park anywhere else. And let's see, there's another shot and then this shot down the side. So I talked to Ed and Rick and Mary about this, and we, we prayed about it, and I got in touch with the realtor. Well, I decided that I wasn't going to call my own realtor, and there's a reason why that I'll get into hopefully here in a few minutes. So the first time inside, I had never been in the building before. I actually had called the people that were on the sign, and I wanted to work through a man. You've heard us pray for his son, Cole Sackis. It was John Sackis. John Sackis. And you'll hear that name again as we go through this presentation. This is just a little testimony of prayer and how prayer works. We had been praying for a place. We wanted to find somewhere that was close enough and that, that was affordable. We were willing to rent a place, but this place was for sale. So my first time inside, I walked in through that front door there, and this is what I saw. I just took this picture, and then we opened the doors, and here was the sanctuary with this kind of burnt orange, brownish color. What, what would you call that color? Ugly, Rick says. <laughs> That's it. That's the color, the color ugly. That's right. And uh, it was as probably at least 40 or 50 years old, I would guess. And this is a little better shot there. You can see the, there are two pianos. There's one in the lower right corner and one in the far back. Uh, and there's a little railing, a little parapet railing there across the platform, across the stage. 
and then this was the view that I'm seeing right now when I look back through the church. I can look at those back doors right here from the, from the lectern. And so these are the first pictures. Now, if you notice, the ceiling was kind of uh, falling apart there. And in this next shot, this is the ceiling in this little room to my left. As you're facing, it would be to your right. That's one of the air handlers. And you can see the hole in the ceiling. I don't know what kind of rodents were up in there. And this was on the floor that very day. It was snowing indoors. And uh, this, is, this is what we had to look at. And this was also in the same room to my left. And I took a picture of the ladies' room here. You can see the old rusty sink. And this was the men's room. You can see how rough everything looked. And then my buddy, John Sackis, he, he says, get up on that stage. I'm going to take a picture of you if you're going to be preaching from here. And, you know, when I looked at the place, I, I wasn't so sure. <laughs> um, and so we went in the basement. We decided we'd go downstairs and have a look. And this is the tag that was on the furnace that was down in the very last room and down in the bottom. And this was, I couldn't quite read it on the picture, but I believe the date on that that they had tagged it as un, unfit for use was uh, 1984. Does that sound right? It was 10-20 of 1984. So think about how long ago that was, 1984. You know, this year, that's 40 years ago. So that's right. So then that was, that was what, 31 years prior that that furnace had been red tagged as unsafe. And the hallway was... Um, like this, there was some lots of stuff downstairs. Now, uh, some of the this was one of the first pictures I took of the downstairs. Now, the whole basement pretty much looked like this, wouldn't you say? It was just filled with stuff, filled with stuff. It was used as a storage house and kind of a junk room. And then, after we had actually the this is what it also looked like. Uh, this. That platform was downstairs in the fellowship hall. And uh, there's a story behind that that you'll see here in just a moment. Brother Ed cut that platform out, and he and Rick somehow heave hoed that thing upstairs, the part of it. I, that had to be heavy. I don't know how y'all did it. And then, of course, this is one of the side rooms. I think this is the room right where the, um, maybe where the, People get dressed when they come. Is that the dressing room that's fixed up nicely now? I didn't get a picture of that. This was the ceiling in the hallway going down the stairs as you go down to the fellowship hall. And th th this was, we had to clear a path to get downstairs because the steps were covered at the bottom. And so I took a couple of pictures from behind just to show the peeling paint, to show the steps that were there. Uh, this was, these ladders were here. I'm going to get into this. I'm going to try to make this very, pretty brief. I'm just trying to go through a lot of the pictures right now. And then, of course, here we are back to the front of the church. So this was my first tour of this Prophecies of Hope Church. Now, just to give you a little history, the original price of the church when we called the realtor was $95,000. That was the asking price. That was this building the building beside it, and the, there were five lots, I believe, five or six lots behind us. And all of those were, all of that was sold as a unit. And so we figured, okay, what do we have to do? So Rick and I scheduled a meeting with the city officials to go down and talk with the city officials and see what do we do with this. We found out some things about the property. We found out that it's in a FEMA flood zone. It's zoned as a flood area. So I talked to some neighbors. I talked to a guy down here. We went down and searched the city records, and we found that it has never flooded here since the record keeping in the city of Stanton, which has been the 1800s. There was never a record of any flood taking place at this address. Well, there's a miracle in itself, because you would not believe the amount of water that ends up everywhere else when, when it floods in this area but this has always remained dry. So we felt like this is, this is pretty good. You know, this is, this is miraculous. So keep in mind, we're praying the whole time, whatever God's will is. If it's your, your will for us to have this building, make it happen. Let's make it happen. So 
Because it's in a FEMA flood zone, we couldn't borrow the money from a banking institution without having flood insurance. And that flood insurance was going to cost approximately, if I remember correctly, $600 a month. A month. Well, that just blows the budget because we're a teeny tiny ministry. We didn't have that kind of funding. Funding. We, yeah, we didn't have a budget. <laughs> Mary said, we didn't have a budget. And, and it's true. We didn't. We were, we were doing this on prayer and faith that God would provide. And so, you know, in spite of what we saw, for some reason, I was encouraged. I thought, this is, this is going to happen. This can, you know, we just got to push a little bit. You got to seek. You have to knock. You have to ask, right? That's what we did. We kept seeking God in prayer. We kept knocking on his door. And, and we, kept, we kept asking over and over and over. So I, I didn't call. I mentioned up front, I didn't call the normal realtor that I deal with. Because I knew, I knew he would say, you don't want that building. <laughs> I knew he would say that. Because I knew the guy too well. And he would, he would say, no, that place, it's a disaster. You're going to have more problems than you can shake a stick at. And he would have just, he would just went out, out of his way to make me miserable over this. So uh, I ended up calling, like I said, John Sackis. And since he was actually a lender, he wasn't in a position where he could do it without insurance. He had to meet the federal laws. But he said, I can't act as your agent if you want to do it. So I said, absolutely. We talked about it. We said, let's make him our agent. We, we got together. No decisions were made individually. That's the other thing that I want you to know. Not one decision was made for this ministry that wasn't made collectively and without prayer. Every decision. Is that a fair statement? Every decision, every little nuance we made together. So a couple of days later, I'm driving by, you know, just the curiosity. Uh, I'm driving by, and I saw that the for sale sign was gone. <gasps> And I thought, no, this can't be. So I called, the, I called the people who had the sign up, and they said, oh, it must have, we, we took it down because we're doing, going every 90 days or so, I think they do a, an MLS, they relist. And they said, we took it down, we're going to put up another sign, and we've decided, I hadn't even made an, we hadn't even made an offer yet, had we, at this point. And we were, we were thinking about what we were going to offer them we found out that it had to, had to be zoned as a church. The building could not be used for anything else. And we said, well, that's perfect. We found out that it had never flooded here. We said, that's perfect. We found out that um, the city officials were willing to work with us on whatever aspects we needed to, to get permits to do the things that had to be done. And we also checked the assessed value of the property. And the whole property assessed at $70,000. So we talked about it, we prayed about it, and we said, well, why don't we make an offer of $70,000? Now, this was all without talking to the real estate people yet. And so what happened was that day when I'm driving by and the sign was gone and I called them, they said, well, we're going to relist it, and we're relisting it at $76,000. We hadn't even asked anything yet, and the price had already dropped. So we then, at that moment, I said, well, you know, we've talked about this as a ministry, and we're willing to offer you the assessed value pending a loan for the property. And they accepted. So we had John write up the contract, and he, he got it all approved and everything. So now here we are. We have this money that we can't borrow from a bank because we can't afford the, the insurance. For the, for the flood insurance. But we had worked, we had figured out, okay, the electric bill is probably going to be this. We started to budget and figure out what's it going to take to operate. Because keep in mind that nobody here, nobody here is paid. This is all volunteer. Prophecies of Hope has never taken an offering. It's all volunteer. There's no, you know, people are surprised when they come from other churches and say, you didn't take an offering. That's right, we don't. God will provide. He sends people who provide what we need. And through, through things that we've been able to do, we've been able to provide by the blessings that he's given us. So pending the loan, they accepted the offer. 
Well, we figured out, I think Brother Rick had done some checking, and he says, we're probably looking at about $10,000. It's going to need a roof. So we don't want to just borrow the seventy. dollars We want to borrow $80,000. So we made it a matter of prayer. I called a couple of private lenders that I knew, and nobody was willing to do it. And then after a couple of days, we had been praying about it, um, we approached a, a man who does ministry as well and, and said, this is what we'd like to do. This is what we're looking for. If you know anybody, let us know. Because he had a lot of leads. He knew a lot of people. And he says, well, let me think about it. And a couple of days later, he calls back, and I got Rick on the phone. We had a conference call. And he says, you know, my wife and I are sitting on a mountain of blessings, and we are We've been looking to help a ministry similar to this. He says, so um, what we're going to do, he says, you're asking for $80,000. And we said, yes, that'll purchase the property and put a roof on it, and we'll take care of the rest. Whatever else it needs, we should be able to deal with it. And he says, well, I'll tell you what. He says, we're going to send you a check for $80,000. And we said, well, okay, so what we need to know is what is the interest rate and what are the terms of payback? And he says, well, he says, uh, there are no terms of payback. And we said, well, you know, we have to have flood insurance on this. You know, what? He says, well, I don't believe in flood insurance. I believe in divine insurance. He says, and you're not going to be paying me back. This is a gift. And they sent the money. They sent the money. I couldn't believe it. I had to black it out because the person wanted to remain anonymous. A gift from God. This couple sent $80,000 to be able to purchase the church and put a roof on it. I wasn't asking him for the money. We said, if you know anybody that's in the business of lending, a private lender, we're interested in talking to them, but we don't have the funds for... That's an answer to prayer. That's a tremendous answer to prayer. God provided it. And this was the closing check. We went to DuPont Community Credit Union. This was the closing check with the commissions, the fees, the interest, whatever. Well, not interest, but the closing costs and everything. We actually negotiated all of that with the seller. Uh, John Sackis did that for us. And that was the actual selling price on the closing day. Now, there's something that happened, though that I, I didn't get into yet, but I'll, I'll mention this quickly. Right before we were going to close, we were getting ready to close on the property, and what happened was, I did that, Zach, just so you don't panic. Um, what happened was, I just happened to be, you notice I say just happened to be, I was looking over the contract and I realized, wait a minute, this isn't surveyed right. They don't have the lots on this paper. Remember, I called. And I think, I don't know if I took a picture of it or sent it to you, but after we looked at it, we said, no, it's not here. It's not here. So I called the real estate off. I called John Sackis, and he, we got the attorneys on the phone, and it delayed the closing, so we had to wait. And then finally, we closed on a very special day to me. They got it all worked out. Everything was worked out. It worked out absolutely perfectly. I've got some notes here. Let me make sure. Let's see. I, I, this, these were some notes that I took years ago because I'm documenting this stuff as we go along over the years. And Mary has a lot of this stuff in her computer too because we track the miracles that God has done for us. And, and here's what I have. The day before the original scheduled closing date, I was looking over the contract and noticed the address was right, but the plat looked incomplete. I made a phone call to the attorney's office and it just, ha just happened to ask the right questions. I put just happened in quotes which led to finding out that it was zoned incorrectly on the plat and it was written up wrong in the closing statement of the contract. If this hadn't happened, the whole property would not have been ours. It would have just been these two buildings and those lots would not belong to Prophecies of Hope as a ministry. So uh, they completed the paperwork, which postponed the closing date. But it, to me, even the closing date was miraculous. The closing date was June the 10th. June the 10th, and the year was 2015. Now, the year to me wasn't significant other than the fact that we closed on this property in that date. But June the 10th is a very special day to me because 
It was June the 10th. I'll tell you this. I got baptized. My wife and I were baptized together May the 11th, 1996. Baptized together into a denomination, into a church. One month later, on June the 10th of 1996, this man, Claude, that I mentioned at the outset, walks into my shop and we got into a Bible discussion. And after that Bible discussion, I knew that I was in the wrong church. I knew there was something wrong with where I was. I'll never forget it. That date, June 10th, 1996, is a very special day to my brother Rick and my sister Mary because this is their daughter Maggie's birthday, June 10th, 1996. The day that I woke up, she woke up to this world. And, you know, it's, it's amazing to me because uh, I was able to be at Maggie's baptism. And that had a very big impact on me. And she gave a testimony that brought me to tears because she mentioned that the things that I had done had an impact in her life. You see how God brings these things together? It's amazing. It's awesome. So June the 10th, 2015, we closed on this building, Prophecies of Hope. And the sellers left the ladders in the basement. We asked them about that. They left them. They were there. Whatever's here it conveys, whatever was in the building, that's, that's what you get. So all the garbage, the 13 toilets that were downstairs, some of them boxed. It, we, it was dump trucks load of garbage that we took out of here. I forget how many. But we took, we took truckloads of garbage out. But we had the ladders that we needed in the basement to do the many projects that we've done around here. They're, still, they're, they're high dollar ladders. They left them. Um, and then some of the miracles that happened. Here's, here's what it looked like outside. This is from the parking lot over here facing the church. I'm going to blast through these very quickly. And then this was the lot. Ed and I actually park our cars where those trees are now. <laughs> My, my, my truck and his Jeep are sitting over there on that side, right where that silver car is, in the bushes. And it's all cleared out. You can see here, uh, a friend that I knew from the shop, he actually works for the Cintas Uniform Company now. Uh, he's our Cintas rep. And back then, I just knew him from knowing uh, Chad, who works at the shop. And he volunteered to help cut these trees down. And he and I came over here, and we cut these trees down. And this is what it looked like by the end of the day. And what's that? Oh, yeah, the hole in the roof, all the way in the back, isn't it, Rick? And then there's one up front, too. So you can see how rough it looked, how rough the building looked. And then this was a round back. There was poison ivy and uh, growing up the side of the building at the rear steps. And then this is um, actually, believe it or not, this is the back of the church. And there's two air conditioning units under those, under that under those trees, which we eventually, we got those cleaned out and cut the tree down. And you can see at the bottom there, those two air conditioning units. And look at that old door that's on the back of the church at the bottom there. And then uh, Rick and Ed are fixing, there was a plumbing issue, I think more than one. And uh, they were fixing some of those things up in the ceiling. This is down at the bottom of the steps. And um, then this was our first Sabbath in the church. June 27th, June 27th, 2015. I have that recorded on the slide. I'd recorded this back when we did it. Um, I think I have June 27th. I don't, I don't know. Maybe we did. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know. But this was the date that I had put down. And you can see there, we're facing forward. We brought the folding chairs. The pianos are still sitting where they were. Uh, that's Corey on your left with the blue shirt. He died a couple of years ago. And Miss Charlotte, who died last year. And Ed, who is still with us. <laughs> Praise God for that. I don't know what we'd do without Ed. Oh, Sabbath school would suffer. And then there's Mary uh, sitting over on the side there. And who's that guy? <laughs> Our brother Rick clowning around. We're clowns when the camera's off. And he was preparing. I think, I don't remember if he was teaching Sabbath school that day, but he was preparing for something there. This was all that same morning. And there, look at that lectern. How do you like that, that cardboard box? I was getting ready to give the first sermon 
they allowed me the privilege of giving the first sermon in this church. I felt such a blessing from that. It's just, it was amazing. And there we are. My nephew Eric was here that particular day. And uh, there's Eric. And that's the camera. That's the camera that we used to do all of the first recordings. And in fact, two cameras were provided, given to us by someone who knew that we wanted to do ministry. These are not cheap cameras. They're thousands of dollars each, and he provided two of them. And what was interesting was he got them on a, we found two of them for the price of one because they were refurbished but came with a brand new warranty. How good is God? And yes, and then over time, somebody had another ministry, had a need, and we ended up, because it was give, given to us, you receive free, you give free. We gave it to the other ministry that they could use it and they still use it. This camera is still used now. In fact, I'll be using that camera this afternoon to make a video for another YouTube channel. So I use that every week. And there's our brother Ed, a couple of years younger. And uh, our, that was our brother Corey and our sister, Miss Charlotte. And here's Rick. I think, yeah, you were teaching Sabbath school from the, the plexiglass lectern. We have that next door. And, and then this is our first hymn that we did in the church right here, doing that together behind the lectern. Uh, Corey was doing the scripture reading. And we needed pews for the church. So Brother Ed gets online and he finds used pews in Newport News. I love saying that because it rhymes. And, <laughs> and uh, he made arrangements to uh, rent a rider truck. And then our brother Jay Smiley lent us his truck, and he had a trailer, and he let us use those. And we had it worked out. Ed worked it all out. He says, I think we can get all of these pews from this other church that was going to put regular chairs in. I think we can get them in both of these trailers. And let me tell you, it worked out perfectly. So uh, the fellow standing there profiling, that's, that's my buddy Steve. We went to high school together. He lives right around the corner. He and I have been through a lot. He's the one that I told you about that... Uh, gave me a book to read. And I said, if you can't tell me what's in that book, then you don't know what you believed. He wouldn't mind me saying that because we're, we're, we're like brothers. But the pews were found and the funds were provided. They were made available for, for putting those pews right here in this church. That's what you're sitting on right now, those pews that you have in that truck. And when we went to get them, uh, between those two trucks, it was exact. We couldn't have got one more pew in either truck. Isn't that right, Ed? Neither one. So there's the other trailer. This was, what was, what was his name? Ar was this, this, this was your neighbor. Arlie? Yes, Brenda's husband. You've given a testimony about Brenda. So this was, uh, this was Ed's neighbor. So Steve and, and was, what was his name, Arlie? Arlie. They volunteered to go with us all the way to Newport News. And Steve's wife made us some chocolate chip cookies and we, they were really good. We ate those on the way. I had the privilege of doing the wedding for Steve and his wife. So, uh, and then this is uh, the speakers that you're listening to right now. They're behind the wall here, and we installed those. You know, the interesting thing, one of the things that Mary sent me in the testimony that she had was we had the exact amount. I had some remnants of speaker wire, and these speakers are from an old sound system that we used to use. And and we had the exact amount of speaker wire we needed to the inch to be able to put the sound system in. Didn't have to go buy it. it was, we already had it. Also, this was our first sound booth in the back. This is the AV booth, Zach, in the first days. This is, this is where you would have been sitting. <laughs> and you can see everything. Wires are going every, every, everywhere. But you know what? We had what we needed when we needed it. It was provided. And uh, our brother, uh, David Allen, gifted us a mixer that we needed and a surge protector that cut a big hum. We had a hum in the PA system, and he fixed that for us by sending us what we needed as a gift. Also, I mentioned the cameras already. We needed a, a printer, a copier, to be able to print things and to be able to uh, make little flyers and, and things like our, our handbills and these, these bulletins that we print. And it actually folds them just like this. It staples. It does everything. And one of our uh, Christian brothers from another ministry contributed the printer that we have. 
Now, I want to tell you, I know I'm going into a lot of detail here, but just to show you how God works, everything that was done here was paid for without borrowing any money. We were going to borrow the money for the church, but that was given to us. All of these things were given to us. The, the gift of the pews was given to us by someone from Prophecies of Hope. And, you know, we, try, we don't want to puff anybody up. We don't want to bring anybody down. And, and most people want to remain anonymous. But there was a, 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 the brother who bought that copier for Prophecies of Hope. It was actually this machine, if we would have bought it new, would have cost about $16,000. And we ended up finding one that was coming, just happened to be coming off of lease. And it was completely refurbished. We got it with a new warranty. With a, it had a three-year contract. And he got it for a fraction of the cost. A fraction of the cost. Uh, yeah, I've got a picture of that later. Ed told me I took some pictures later on, uh, earlier this morning, rather. Now... Uh, the other thing is my brother Russ had this baker's rack, they call it, that we needed inside the church. We were going to have to rent it, but he had exactly what we needed, exactly the right size, which is kind of unusual from what I understand, that we would have the, the exact size rack and scaffolding that we needed for the interior work here in the sanctuary. And we were able to purchase the exact lighting that we need that you see now. You can see on that picture there that it was just fluorescent tubes, and Rick had just hung the first light. And then uh, we wanted the dimmer switches. In fact, these lights up here behind this, there are lights behind here. I don't know if any of you online knew that, but there are lights here. You can see them reflecting on the back wall. And there are dimmers here. And with the old wiring, we didn't know if they would work. So we went ahead and, and went, I think it was to Lowe's, and these dimmers were supposed to be about, about $40 a piece. And it ended up, we ended up getting a couple of them for $15. And then when we needed some more, I went back, and the manager said, you know what? I'm just going to mark these down. He gave them to us for $3.50 a piece. I mean, how does this stuff happen? I didn't ask him to mark them down. You know, it's not like we're asking for favors here. It was provided. This is just the way it happened. And in spite of the old wiring, those dimmers worked absolutely perfectly. And that's a, that's a miracle in itself because these dimmers require a neutral and they said, it, it, when I called uh, Lutron, they said, some of them will work without a neutral. And if it does, it's perfectly safe. So if it works, you're, you're set. They worked. <clears throat> Amazing. Amazing. And then this is a, a brother named Shane. He is actually a Sabbath-keeping Christian. And uh, we didn't know that until he came to work here. We, we told him when, when he wanted to do the ceiling and actually, uh, I think Rick and Ed had put the drywall up and fixed, patched everything up and had made a brace, and the, they did everything that needed to be done. Well, he was going to, what do you call that, Rick? Stamping. Thanks, Mary knew that. Rick didn't even answer. Thanks, Mary. You've been hanging around Rick a long time, haven't you? <laughs> anyway, um, when we told him, you know, you can come every, any day you like, but we, we don't want you, we can't let you do it on Saturday because we believe that's a bib biblical Sabbath. Come to find out, well, I do too. I wouldn't do it on that day anyway. So we met a fine brother there. He did some work for us on Miss Charlotte's house also. So there was that downstairs picture. There's Rick patching that hole. He's got a ladder on the steps. I was terrified. Yes. Go back a second. I'm sorry. Yeah, there was the hole. Thanks, Zach. I, there was the hole, and then there's Rick fixing that hole. He cut it out. And uh, then we had to buy windows, so we put all new windows. I went with, I, I had a rollback at that time, which I no longer have. We loaded them on there and brought them back. And these were the old windows, which uh, Brother Ed repurposed those windows and used them in cabinets that he built for the bathrooms that are in there now, the glass, yeah. So uh, there's Brother Ed after taking out our first window, I think, that we did upstairs. He's waving through that window. There were weights in the in the uh, walls, and there's Corey. He serviced the air conditioning unit. Now, these air conditioning units were from 1975. The one on your left, the one that he's actually standing behind on our left looking at it, is still functioning today. It still works on this side of the church, on the right side if you're facing the front. And it works better than the new unit 
that we replaced. The new unit doesn't work as good as the old one. All this high efficiency stuff. So uh, what a blessing. We had a new electric, electric box put in. All of that was done. And here's Brother Ed doing the... This was the job that I think he loved the most. No, <laughs> I'm just teasing. This, this, was, this was in the foyer when you walk in. That's actually in the mother's room, isn't it? And that's where that is. But this tile was all throughout, underneath the carpet. And then here's Brother Rick Tyler doing tile work. Rick Tyler. And it's not spelled the same, but it's fun to say. And uh, the back of the building here, my brother Russ did the uh, pressure washing and you know, my sister-in-law, Donna, had prayed about this because he has some arthritis. And somehow, miraculously, he got through this whole job with very little trouble. And that was a miracle. Donna will tell you that to this day. And then, of course, um, we did pay roofers to do the roof. Most everything on this church was done primarily by the expertise of Ed and Rick. And I, I'm just a kind of watcher. I can hand them tools. I can dig a hole. I did that when we did the sign, didn't I? <laughs> and uh, this was the furnace room. There was a giant furnace. It weighed hundreds and hundreds of pounds. And my nephew Eric got part of the boilers out. The boilers were huge. There's the new furnace. As I was showing Brother Wayne yesterday, I realized these furnaces are nine years old. Now, the gas line was installed. The gas had been cut off to the building. The gas line was installed weeks earlier. Uh, than the target date. They had set a date, and somehow they got here sooner than we expected. We had a Bible series that was coming up that year that we wanted to have here, so we wanted to have heat in the church. And it was scheduled to be installed the week the series was, was going to start, but the gas was in place to heat the church quicker, but we had to have it inspected. So Rick was working in Stanton, which is very unusual. He doesn't work in Stanton. He usually works about 40 miles north of here, and 30 to 40 miles. And he was working in Stanton, and unexpectedly, he got off early that day, and he happened to come by here. And he got here to find the inspector waiting to get the church final inspection for the final stuff that we had done, all the inspection stuff. I'm leaving out so much, because this could be hours long. I'm just trying to blast through it quickly. So if that man wasn't able to get in here for the final inspection, we couldn't have had the Bible series here because we had to have an occupancy permit. So we, were, we had been praying about that, and it happened. The furnace was installed. It was inspected in time for the 2015 Bible Prophecy Series, the first one we had in this building. This is that platform downstairs that Brother Ed and Brother Rick, that thing is heavy. Uh, that's what, uh, actually, that's what the AV booth is sitting on right now. It's sitting on that platform in the back. And it was restained. And then downstairs in the fellowship hall, Brother Rick did this beautiful tile work. And now on that back wall, we have, a, we have a, what we call a baptistry. And uh, it's a place where we can baptize folks. In the office next door, the building next door, there was this old stove that was there. And all it needed was a heating element, I believe. Uh, the clock keeps perfect time. It was clean as a whistle. And now it's down in the fellowship hall. Hey, how'd that picture get in there? <laughs> That's our sister Mary. Um, so, and that refrigerator also was available, and it was from the building next door as well. So the stove and the refrigerator that are downstairs now, nine years later, are still functioning. And that stove is from 1964, I believe. It's an old General Electric stove. And then these steps, Brother Ed refinished them sanded them, put a beautiful finish. They still look just as good today. And then there's some fat guy in here painting the sanctuary, some bald fat guy there. And uh, <laughs> healthy, Mary said, healthy, healthy guy. <laughs> That's, oh, is there? Okay, okay. So, <laughs> so um, there, there we go. And my brother Russ came in and painted this place so quick. I thought I was doing good, and he came in and just knocked it out. That's, that's his work. That's what he did for a living. He owned a painting company. And this is the old piano. It's still back here. And, you know, Brother Zach actually found this um, Steinway in a nursing home that was given to us. You, want, you can point over there if you like, Zach. 
let everybody see it. It's an upright, but it keeps perfect tune. Our friend Paul C. Cord has tuned this one as well as he tuned the other one. He came all the way, two hours away, to tune the piano for the series. Everything was lining up. That same year that we had purchased the church, everything lined up that we could have the series here just a few months later. From what, June, right? June, July, August, September, October. Within four months, all of these things that you're seeing here took place with just a few workers. With just a few workers. Maybe I should say just two workers. So, um, and then this was another piano. This is kind of odd, but uh, Mr. Secord did come. He tuned this piano, and our sister Sherry, who you hear Brother Rick pray for and Brother Ed pray for, the Schumachers in Minnesota. Sister Sherry came and played the piano the first year. And then the um, uh, Sturgis, uh, uh, Ed and Diane, Diane came and played another year for us. So um, kind of an odd piano. It's an English piano. There's only two pedals on it, and it only has 85 keys, not 88 keys. And I learned something from Mr. Secord that piano music is not written for 88 keys. There's no music that's written for 88 keys. It's only written for 85. Didn't know that. So this was our first night of the Prophecies of Hope 2015 series. I took this picture from outside, and this is what it looked like lit up at night. And boy, we had painted the front door. The outside had been painted. The porch was painted. Uh, Brother Rick and Brother Ed put up a new railing. We still had the lean-to roof on at that time, and this was our first series. We didn't have the monitors up yet, but you can see the pews are there. We had the makeshift sound booth in the back, and we had a nice turnout. In fact, Ed and I were looking at this picture earlier, and we saw some people that we knew. We recognized them from the back. And, um, you know, the first night, like I said, we did, never took up an offering, but I'm going to tell you what happened. There were some things that we knew we wanted to do in the future. We never mentioned that to anybody. It was only the team at Prophecies of Hope knew what was needed. And that night in the donation box in the back, there's a box on the wall for free giving whenever somebody wants. There were $6,000 in that box. And it provided exactly what we needed to continue to do things. $6,000 in one night without asking for a dime never taking up an offering. And um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to come back to that in just a moment because part of that you'll see at the end. Uh, so this is, these are the final slides I'm showing you now. So this was the first night we were doing the Daniel 2 message. And we had a projector that was provided for us that we used at, at the Mennonite church when we were meeting in that Sunday school room. And the projector would sit here and project on this wall and I was standing over on the side with these lights. And it, it worked. It worked. It was functional. And so here was the building the day, the first day I took a picture of it. This is what it looked like. This, that's the office to the left. And you can see the old siding and the old building, the lean-to roof. And then this was inside the office next door. When you looked in there, there was some, it wasn't nearly as bad as the basement, but the carpeting was decent. And, and you could see the old stove sitting over there. Well, this is the office this morning. I took this picture this morning. Brother Ed said, go over there and take some pictures and let them see what it looks like. So we have that table that Brother Ed built that. He built this lectern. And uh, it's, it has beautiful blue epoxy. Isn't that what it is? That's yes, you use for filler. The wood was from the studs from a wall downstairs. The wood was from the studs from a wall downstairs that we removed. And so he took that wood and used it. And it is beautiful, the finish on that table. And the reason that he used the blue epoxy is because God's law is blue. The blue commandment, sapphire stone. So God sits on his throne, which is on, as it were, sapphire, right? And so uh, this is a picture of the, we put those little pads <laughs> Twice, we put those little pads on the wall. They're, they're sound deadeners. They're in the studio in a separate room next door. This is where we do the radio broadcast. You can see the, the, those really nice mics there, uh, Sennheiser mics, and they give a tremendous sound quality. The first time Brother Ed and I put those things up on the wall, we came in the next day, and they were all in on the floor. <laughs> so we had to find a different adhesive, and we put them back up. And this is the kitchenette. Uh, Brother Rick put that, those cabinets and countertop in. 
you can see now that that building has those little split duct air conditioning units. And you know what? It's been a blessing a couple of times for our sister Mary. She works from home. She does a lot of computer work, and sometimes they lose power. And there's been a couple of times that she's had to come and use that office for her work. What a blessing that we had the facility for her to be able to do her job and, and to be able to continue. It's not as comfortable as home, but it functions. <laughs> and then and this is our, I guess you would call this the media room. Uh, the CD burner was provided for Prophecies of Hope. The, there was a label where we used to burn a lot of CDs and give them away at the series. But now the internet has kind of made that obsolete, but we can still do it. It'll burn up the seven CDs at a time. And that little robotic uh, printer prints the DVD labels. And so we, we were, were prepared to do ministry. God gave us this as a gift. So we were doing DVDs and we were giving them away. And then this is the copier. This is the copier that prints out these bulletins and the little study guides that we put together with outlines from sermons. So you've seen the before and after of the office. Here is the after of the church. This is what it looks like from outside now. You notice Brother Rick put a gabled front porch on. I was here when he was doing that, holding his ladder. <laughs> and uh, you notice there's also a sign right there. There's, you can see the Prophecies of Hope sign. I did dig the hole for that sign for the footers, and, and Brother Rick and I put the, put the block down to get that sign put up. We had to have a special sign because this is on the entry corridor of the historic area of Stanton. So at nighttime, at the daytime, you notice most signs, the background is, is white and the letters are black. This is opposite. The background is black and the letters are white. So these letters are actually transparent. So at nighttime, the light comes on behind it, and it lights the letters up so you can read it. And, and that was we had to have that particular sign for the city of Stanton. And they worked with us on this and, and helped us to get everything to specs the way we needed it. They've really been good working with us, the city has. And so here's the before, the Bread of Life Church, and here is now. Prophecies of Hope. Here is the before, the office, and the church together. And I didn't get a side view, but here is now. I guess I could run out there and now and take a picture, but I won't. And then here is the view that I, would, I saw the first day I walked in and stood on this stage. That's what I saw. And this is what it looks like today, except there are some people sitting in the pews. I'm looking at some lovely faces. So you've heard me mention John Sackis. We've been praying for his son, Cole. John Sackis was the realtor. John and Rick actually climbed up in the attic the first day, well, the first week. It wasn't the first day, but it was the first week that we looked at this building to make sure it was structurally sound. They went through the basement. They went up in the attic. It's all rough-cut lumber because it was built in probably the 30s or 40s. And they, they looked it over and said, it's a solid building. Well, here's our brother, John Sackis. This is what he looks like. And uh, a fine Greek brother. And he, um, uh, what was interesting about this is he, he got the building for us as far as doing all the real estate paperwork. He did all of the uh, uh, negotiating with the other people and with the sellers. And then once the building was sold, he, he got his commission but he gave it back to Prophecies of Hope. He gifted his commission to the church. And that was part of what was in the box. He was here for the first night of the series. And that's part of what was in the contribution box in the back. You know, God provided everything we needed. And he continues to provide everything that we need and more. Now, just a couple of things. You know, I didn't cover near the things that are here. There's a lot more. You know, this isn't all. This isn't all. This, the things that happened here, the labor that was done, the painters, the woodworking, the metal working for this lectern. Almost knocked my drink over. This little shelf is for my drink. God provided everything. The sound equipment. We had the sound equipment already. We didn't have to purchase it. Our brother David Allen gifted us the mixer that we need and, and the filter that we needed to be able to take the hum out of the, 
PA system. The piano, Brother Zach found the piano for us from a nursing home. It was given to us. The, the, yeah, the, oh, the, what did you, the Bible. Yeah, this, was, was this here? Where did this come from? You'll have to remind me. This was gifted to us. And this Bible is actually open to Proverbs 8, which is a very special text. And it's on a little uh, lazy Susan. That, and Ed made the table, right? Say that again. This table. The, and refinished the stand. And then the, these tables over here. I mean, it's, it's just amazing the things that people have given to this ministry. And the, the talent that was here. The talent to build, the talent to do metalwork, the talent to put in the windows, the talent to fix the air conditioning system. It was all here. God provided it. You know, that happened in the Bible. I want to take you, just closing verses. Take a look here on the PowerPoint. Exodus chapter 31. Exodus chapter 31, beginning in verse 1. And Je This is from the modern King James. And Jehovah spoke to Moses, saying, Behold, I, I have called by name Be Be uh, Bezaleel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all workmanship, to devise designs to work in gold, and in silver, and in bronze, and in cutting stones, to set them, and in carving of timber, to work in all workmanship. It continues. And behold, I have given to Aholiab, the son of Ahishamek, of the tribe of Dan, and I have put wisdom in the hearts of all the wise-hearted so that they may all make all that I have commanded you, the tabernacle of the congregation and the ark of the testimony and the mercy seat that is upon it and all the vessels of the tabernacle and the table and its vessels and the pure lampstand with all its vessels and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering with all its vessels and the layer and its base and the woven garments and the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office and the anointing oil and sweet incense for the holy place according to all that I have commanded you, they shall do. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I've seen that happen here today. God answers prayers today. It's a miracle that this building is here. It's a miracle that it was empty for years and never used as a church. It was used as a junk room. But now it's the house of God once again. It was built as a church. It was abandoned, and now it's used once again as a church. God provided in these men and women everything that was needed to establish this ministry. It's because of you. It's because of what God has done in you. It's because of the things that you have contributed, your time, your talent. He has given you the expertise to be able to do these things. He's given us teachers for Sabbath school, preachers to preach the word, talent and audio video, talent to build websites and repair them. You know, we've got our brother in France that's helping us. He has provided what we needed when we need it. Who commanded and gave these abilities? It was God himself. And we saw that happen here. We've had Bible studies. We've baptized people into Jesus, not into a church or a denomination. We've had a Bible series every year right here in this church since it was established with this ministry. We did it a few years before that as well. But God gave us a place to do it because there were times we didn't know where we were going to go, what we were going to do, where we were going to have it. Can we find a place? He gave us the resources to buy Bibles and give them away. We purchase Bibles by the case, and we send them all over the world to people who want a Bible. If they want a King James or a New King James Bible, that's what we've been doing. We print study guides. We have a website. We give support to the homeless shelter. It's not us. Who's doing that? God has provided those things. When I say we, we're working with God. You are working with God to do those things. 
He's given us the blessing of being able to do a radio broadcast each week to study with people for an hour on air. And it's all by the grace and power of God through his son, Jesus Christ, that these things happen, that these miracles happen. Was all of this by coincidence? None of it was by coincidence. Not one thing. Not one thing that we're talking about was coincidental. It was all by the power of God. And even unbelieving skeptics, when I talk to them and I tell them what happened about how the funds were received for buying this building, when I say that there are no terms of payback, uh, this is a gift, I've had atheists say, that's a miracle. Well, where do you think miracles come from? <laughs> you know, it was something special, and it's something that happened in this ministry, and we have witnessed it firsthand. And we just wanted those of you, some people have never heard this, some people have known this uh, for, for a while, but we wanted people to be encouraged. Whatever you're praying about, if it's an illness, if it's an addiction, if it's someone who you lost and you think, I can't go on without them, you can get through it, whatever it is. If it's someone that you want to come from another faith to know who the real Jesus is, whatever it is, whatever it is, pray about it. God answers prayers today. He will continue to do it. And, and my goal is to continue to preach the gospel, to continue to do these things. As long as God gives me the ability to do it, as long as I can draw breath and I can speak, as long as I can stand up and do the things that I'm doing, if he gives me the opportunity, I made a promise to him that I would do whatever I could in my power to preach the gospel to as many as who would listen if he gave me the ability to do it. That in itself is a miracle. I've told you that before because I was very introverted. And I just feel so blessed and so privileged. That prayer alone, if God never answered another prayer for me, the fact that I've been able to share the gospel with people means more to me than you could imagine. And the prayer that I need help with is to be able to preach the gospel to my wife and have her hear it. I believe God answers prayers today. There's something I must lack, or maybe the timing isn't right. I know one thing. If my wife would have been a part of this at some points, she might not be here now because we've seen some interesting things happen through the years, good and bad. And sometimes people are, are protected by God from seeing those things that they don't need to see. He keeps them out of the way until such time that they're ready for it. And maybe that's the case. But remember, friends, this ministry is not by anything that we have done. God gave us the talents to be able to do those things. It wasn't in our own power that any of these, these things happened. Not one of them happened based on us. I can't do this on my own. This is not, this is against, what I'm doing now is against what I, who I was. So if this sermon does nothing else, if, if this presentation does nothing else, I hope that it will help you to recognize that God does answer prayers today.